Well, good morning. Another week and another virtual service. Welcome to our virtual campus. My name is Brian Stevenson. I'm one of the congregational elders here at Provision Church, and this is Mark Navy, our lead teaching pastor. And uh, you know, uh, we're I, I don't like that we're getting accustomed to this, but at least we're kind of getting into a little bit of a routine as yeah. we get to hang out with you guys before we start our time of worship. Yeah, this is definitely a little bit of a groove we're getting into. Uh, I hope that you logging on right now are starting to feel a little more comfortable. Like it took us a little bit to get our start time right and get how we're doing this. And I think we've kind of got our elements together now of what our Sunday morning worship service looks like. And I hope that helps you feel a little more comfortable with this and helps you enjoy this a little more, that that there's some expectation of what a Sunday morning starts looking like and feeling yeah. like. Well, in the last couple of weeks, it's been great to have some music incorporated. Uh, the the uh, Shannon and all the musicians and the singers, they've just done such a great job of, of just leading us in that. And uh, you get to see that a look, look, little bit different today, still bringing you music, but uh um, you'll, you'll get to see what I'm talking about in a few minutes there, but just uh, some really uh, uh, powerful worship, um, just just power in the songs and the message this morning, and I know you're really going to get a lot out of that, and I hope you'll sing along too. So uh, it's been good to kind of at least, like you say, get that rhythm and get different parts incorporated back into it. Yeah, a new element to our rhythm is that we had a, last week we did a, like a Zoom chat at, from 945 mm-hmm. to 10, and as we were doing that, we were like, wait, we can't watch the intro now. Like, this is kind of a weird overlap. So today we started at 915 to 945. So welcome if you're joining us from the Zoom chat, if you're getting into this time. Uh, welcome if you're not <laughs> joining us from the Zoom chat. Welcome if you're joining us as you're grabbing your coffee and you're getting your kids settled. And if you're just w- opening your eyes for the first time this morning, wherever you are, however you are, welcome. And uh, we... Uh, yeah, we hope those Zoom chats or the that kind of extension of the virtual lobby catches yeah. on because um, it really does change things. Like right now, I'm talking to you, but I can't see you. <laughs> like you don't have a chance to talk back to me. And so this is a, a weird element of a connection. But when we're able to get in those uh, Zoom or Google Meet lobbies together yes. and actually talk back and forth, it feels good. It feels like fellowship, even if we don't get to see each other in person. And so if you didn't tune in this morning at 915, uh, Jim Korth is one of our congregational elders. He's hosting it. Uh, Tune in next Sunday morning. I I know some of you really might not have woken up until 930 or even 945 to see this. Um, And so it might take waking up a little bit earlier on a Sunday morning. I think it'd be worth it. And if you're not sure how to log in, then you need to be opening our churchwide emails. Uh, we send out emails. Our administrative assistant, Erin Stevenson, is awesome, and she sends out an email two times a week. And if you're not getting that email, you can go to our website, provisionchurchnc.com, and at the bottom of the website, you can sign up for that email. If you are getting that email and you're just not clicking on it, <laughs> you should click on it. There's some really good information in there. And one of the things is all the information that you need for that kind of pre-lobby time. We're calling it a virtual lobby hangout with Jim Korth. So all that's right there in that email for you. Yeah, and, and you know, here's the thing. We're None of us are, or at least nobody I've encountered yet, is an expert at this stuff. So if you say, I don't know how to do that, I've never done that, neither have we a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're learning too. So give yourself some latitude and don't let it be um, an inhibitor for doing that stuff because – I got to tell you, when we pulled up the um, the virtual um, or the meet meet for our um, life group the other week, it was so good just to see faces. And you can talk on the phone, but I could see Lynn Carey smile and laugh, and I could see Nelson and Claudio and Sandra and and Shannon, and we just all were just sitting there. And we get to, it, it, there's just something about that connection. We can't have that in person connection that we all love. So that's a really cool thing. And maybe you haven't had that connection with anyone. So try to do this. We even did it Sunday night with uh, Aaron's family. It was, uh, cool. it was so cool because normally we'd be leaving church, you know, after we broke everything down and, and getting together for a big lunch and, and hanging out on Easter. And so uh, Sunday evening we got together with, with her whole family. So we had, we had, you know, from Wingate to Unionville and then Baltimore, Maryland and um, uh, Hodgeville, Kentucky. So we, we were, cool. we were all over the place getting to hang out and see each other and 
and share some laughs and, and just reconnecting. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think about just the timeline that God, God knows timing. Like God knows everything that happens and just how crazy it is that we get to live in the timeline where when a pandemic shuts everything down, that we still are able to communicate this way. Cause you know, we talk about the history of this. Okay, sure. We got the Spanish flu in the early 1900s. That would have been terrible. What do you even do? I mean, I don't, but what did that really stop you from either? Because the world was not as interconnected at that time as it is now. But it's kind of neat that a part of our interconnectivity has led us and, and helped us develop into where we get to spend time with our family in three different states. Like, yeah. that's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, re- it really is. And, and so, so all that to say is we're, we're just kind of ramping up to our time of worship this morning. We, you know, I know a lot of times, even when I'm looking for stuff that's coming on live, it takes me a second to to connect and find it and get on. And so what we didn't want to happen is you to be looking for that and then miss something good in the worship service and, and kind of log in 10 minutes in. So we start this time early so you can find the feed and you can hang out and say, oh, I've got it. Good. I can let it play there and let these guys talk for a few more minutes and then we get to the worship time. So that's what we're doing here. And um, we just, we hope you'll keep doing it. And, and like I say, add to that, maybe get up earlier next week and hang out with Jim and get to see some other church members. So yeah, it's pretty yeah, cool. Absolutely. Well, we want to keep encouraging as what well, encouraging you as well uh, to, to join a life group. If your life group is meeting online, meet with them, <laughs> like make that effort. If you're not sure how to do that, then let us help you. Uh, comment here, direct message us. We can help you. It's pretty simple. And I would say too, if you're not in a life group and you're interested in one, but you're like, eh, it would be super awkward to try to join a, an already formed life group digitally. Like I don't want to do that for the first time on the computer. I, I want to put you at ease a little bit. And just as someone who's a part of a life group, uh, it's not that weird. And I, this is kind of like one of those take my word for it things. And I, I wish I could give you a little more concrete example than that, but it, it's, it's not bad. It, it doesn't, doesn't feel too awkward. And so if you want to just try one out, if, if there's people that you know that are in a life group and they're meeting virtually right now, uh, you should definitely connect with that. Just kind of reach out and say, Hey, I want to be there. Some of you may have had people reach out to you this week, uh, asking for you to join life groups take the chance, man, take that leap of faith and, and step out and join a life group. I've seen life groups be so essential in this time. Like in in these few weeks where we've been quarantined, I was actually talking to one of our life group leaders yesterday. And that's what he said. It's kind of the lifeblood of our church right now. And I a hundred percent agree with that characterization of our life groups. Absolutely. So if you're not a part of that, then you're, you're missing a really cool connection with your fellow church members. And and the cool thing is, you know, some some people might be joining us and they don't even understand what a life group is. It's, you know, um, yep. it's not Sunday school per se. Um, it's, it's smaller groups, but usually families, singles, whatever, um, where we get together and, and all our curriculum is, is sermon-based. Uh, the questions are even online on our website that you can get to very easily. And so when we get there, we usually spend some time just connecting and seeing how everybody's doing, what everybody's going through and, and how their week's been. And I know that in my life group, we are all looking forward to Nelson Carey uh, grilling for us when this is all (laughs) over. Cause if you know, Nelson, he is an amazing cook. And so Nelson's like ready to get out there and start firing up the grill for us. And so um, we, we've been, we were talking about that the other night. Nelson said he's ready to, ready to go. So, uh, but then you spend some time in God's word and you, you take a little time to review the sermon and, and, and kind of go through some questions and it just kind of, it just kind of bolsters what you're learning through your teaching time on Sunday morning. So it's just, just encouraging. Yeah. And I think what we've seen too, it doesn't just re kind of reemphasize what we talk about on Sunday, what you're about to hear. It's not going to just reemphasize the message. It, it, gives opportunity to dig into pieces that like I'm not going to get to cover in 30 minutes of preaching. These texts are so deep. I I don't know who said it, but something like scripture is deep enough for you to swim in, but you know, shallow enough for you to, uh, 
you know, play in uh, something along those lines. I, I'm butchering yeah, that. I was say you, you need to look that one up. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> if you, if y'all know what he's trying to talk about, then uh, put the comments below. And let uh, us know. Right. <laughs> uh, it's a terrible quote. Uh, but but what I'm saying is that. Uh, as much as we try to go deep into these passages together, there's always nuance and there's always perspective and there's always uh, elements of of these passages that I'm not going to be able to get to. And, and, and even application, like I think about the way that this applies. If I were to take time in every sermon and try to meet every person's need of application, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get through the text because I, Everybody is different. And so taking the time in those life groups to really develop the thought, how does that scripture change me? I hope that's not the only way. You, I, I want to be clear. I, I think when we when we work with scripture, how does it help us believe in God or, or teach us about God? What does it teach us about God? That's a really great starting question. But then scripture should change us too. It should, it yeah. should influ- we should be doers of the word. And so as we do the word, what does that mean for my life? What does it mean for me? We talk about all those things in our life group. Yeah, and 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 you know, there, there's so many times where something it's applicable to something going on in our life, or it's or it's a encouragement that hey, I really need to work on that area, or or you know, we're, we're we were just talking with someone the other day that's struggling with that. I mean, it just gives you it, it gives you a chance to just really, like you say, just dig in, and and that's such a such a good thing. I mean, we want to. Uh, just continue to grow in our walk with Christ as young as we are, as old as we are, as mid- like there should be no age until we're called home that we don't want to dig yeah. deeper and grow closer to, to Christ. Yeah. Cool. As you're continuing to log on, uh, we want to say hey to our college students, our Winget students, yes. especially who are not with us, who are not at Winget. Uh, wherever you are, I know we've got Winget students from all over the country, which is really cool. Yeah. And so we just want to say a special hello to you guys uh, and just let you know that we miss you. Uh, we still think about you and are praying for you. Uh, and, hey, if you're watching, let us know. Uh, send, send me a text. Send one of us a text or just comment on these videos. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to know that you're watching. Uh, but but we miss you guys a lot. It, it is so weird. Uh, if, if you don't know, uh, Aaron and I live and our boys live like literally a block from campus and it is so strange right now. We've been walking a lot now that the weather's nice, and it is so strange to walk on an empty campus. It just mm-hmm. we just miss seeing some of you. We miss seeing those change the world shirts that we walk <laughs> by. So it's just it's just uh, it's just it's just different. But we miss you. We're college kids, and we're we're looking forward to the day where you guys can come back. Yeah, I would uh, say. Sorry, I didn't not to interrupt, but I would say for sure that that we're a church. I don't think we're a church with a college ministry. I think we're a church for a college. Like Absolutely. we, we a hundred percent believe that those, that you guys from Wingate are a part of our church. And 100%. so when you're gone, it feels like our church is missing a piece, Yes, which, which it should. I mean, I hope that's how we feel when we send out missionaries and we, and so uh, as we've sent you guys out with our prayers back to your homes, now what seems to be for the summer um, we, we miss you as a part of our church. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm throwing you a little curveball here. He doesn't know I'm going to do this, but we, you know, we said we were going to show a little tour of where we're at. Yeah. So do you, we can either like kind of cut away and show them or, or either put up a separate video. What do you want to do? You, for our, for those of you who don't know, we're at Ebenezer Baptist Church and they've been so gracious to let us make this home base. So we've got a talking area, a preaching area and, uh, Music area, we we like to uh, just just give you a little behind the scenes. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw Brian a curveball. <laughs> I I'd like to give a little more time to this. We're almost out of time yep. right now, and so instead of cutting away right now, why don't we make the promise that this week we'll give them a tour? Okay, uh, of this. Yeah, we said we fair? said we do it. So we'll so we we'll have a separate video. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll do a separate Perfect. video. That, that yeah. sounds even better. Okay. So, all right. So it it is it is cool how we've got how we're putting all of this together. A lot of time and effort goes from a, an awesome team to kind of make this happen every week. So. Yeah, it is, and it's worth seeing. We've only got a couple more seconds left. Yes. Um, but in that time, I wanted to bring up that as a church, we have a really cool gift for you. It is awesome. We Look, we've been blown away by your generosity during this time. I, I think as a church, we look at giving as a way to worship, especially financially. You guys have gone above and beyond, and we're so grateful for that. I, I, it's We're just grateful. It's, it's a God thing, and, and we're, we're grateful for it. Yeah, and, and because of your giving, we're able to do things and minister in ways that we couldn't without your giving. And one of the things that we get to do is provide something for you that I think is going to be really encouraging, and that's Right Now Media. 
And that, that's something that isn't going to cost you anything. The church buys a subscription to that, and uh, you guys get to enjoy it. I think you're going to really enjoy it. And so r- right now, I want to show you just a little bit about what Right Now Media is all about. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum, and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're gonna look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right Now Media. It's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. Well, good morning. If you were just watching that clip and you're just tuning in our service today, then that clip is showing an awesome gift that we're able to give you as the church in this time where we can't be together. It's called Right Now Media, and it is a great resource that anybody connected with Provision Church can be a part of. It gives you access to Bible studies, to training, to lessons, things you can do with your kids, things you can do as adults, studies that you can do. It is pretty amazing the depth of things that are there, and and just and it's all free because the church, because of your generosity, is able to provide that right now. And and Mark, I know you brought this uh, up, and and I was so excited when you did because it's it's going to be a great tool, and I hope that all of you will take advantage of it. It's real easy to sign up. Yeah, and, and so for right now, we're we're aiming for three months of the right now media, uh, and. I want you to take as much advantage as you can during this time. Uh, We'll reassess at the end of three months, but the way that you sign up, the way that you get started is that they'll send you an email. If we have your email address, they will send you an email, and they won't spam you past that. They don't sell those. But if you don't see an email by this afternoon, then you should go look in your spam folders. Go find it because they'll send you an email. And in that email, there'll be a link to sign up. You'll create a username and a password, and then you'll be able to have complete access to Right Now Media's library. I think 20,000 something videos. So, I mean, it's, it's huge. And so it's going to be really good. If you don't get an email and you still want to sign up, we'll have a link under this video uh, or attached to this video somehow where uh, you can s- click and get the access to that. Yeah. Um, so we want you to have access. If you're a guest and you're like, well, I'm not a member, they're not going to have my access, I don't know. This is for you too. It's a gift for everyone. And we're really excited about that. So if you would like to see what Right Now Media is all about, if you'd like to have access to this gift that's free to you, then check your email. And if you don't get an email, then follow the link under this video and you'll be able to have access. It's, it's going to be a great thing. I hope that everyone knows that it's just just a great tool that can really help you in, in your walk, and especially during this time. Yeah, give you something more wholesome, a way to redeem your time at home. Absolutely. All right, well, Kevin Newton uh, is joining us to uh, introduce the message, and so I'm going to send it over to Kevin. Good morning. My name is Kevin Uden. I'm one of the congregational elders here at Provision. Uh, We thank you for joining us this morning, whether you're a first-time guest or a long-time member. uh, We know it can be difficult and different to do church this way, but we just want to thank you for taking time out of your morning to worship with us. Uh, We view giving as another form of worship here at Provision. We want to thank all of our uh, members and 
and guests and anybody that's been with us for being so generous during this time. Uh, we know it's hard. We know there's a, a lot of uncertainty, especially financially, and we just want to thank you for your generosity. If that is something you're interested in and want to do, uh, there's a tab on our website, and that will give you uh, different ways to, to do that, whether regularly or a one-time gift. Before we have a time of uh, music and worship, let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, the uh, willingness of the technology to uh, still have a time together as a church and worship and learn about you. We ask that you bless Mark's words, uh, the words of the song, and all of this time to your glory, and uh, that it will be a time of uplifting and uh, joyous uh, learning and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kind Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave as no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence. The roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Jesus. 
Jesus is yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living home. Jesus Christ, my living home. God, you are my living home. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Even through all of this unprecedented change of life, we can still look to Him. You know, I don't know about you, but I seemingly have a new perspective on life that has come through all of this pandemic, this social distancing that we have to do. Maybe you're like me, and, you know, I hope that we don't just go back to business as usual when all this is over. You know, I was, I was thinking about worship for this week and what we we're going to do, and, and, and Jason here, he asked me about the song, The Heart of Worship. And uh, most of you probably know this song, um, but maybe you don't know uh, was how this song was written. You know, Matt Redman is the songwriter, and back in the 1990s, their church was going through what their pastor thought was a period of apathy. Uh, the congregation was struggling to find their meeting when they sang, even even though their music was incredible. Uh, their heart wasn't in it. They were, they were apathetic. And so the pastor did something that you don't always see. He decided to get rid of the sound system and the band for a season. You know, when they gathered, all they had was their voices, no instrumentalists, nothing else, but their voices lifted up to the Lord. And his point was that they had lost their way in worship. He thought the best way to get back to the heart of worship was to strip everything away. Sound familiar? I mean, I have to admit that, you know, I battled through this pandemic. I, I felt at times as if things have been stripped away from me somewhat, but Maybe, just maybe, that was the best thing for me. I mean, maybe that's the best thing for you. God's calling us to come back to the heart of worship. And as the song says, it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus King of endless world no one would express how much you deserve 
though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made him when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'll bring you more than a song 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 You're looking into my heart You're looking into my I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made him When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus It's all about you, Jesus. Hey church, open your Bibles with me. Chapter 5 in the book of Matthew. We're continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, we're kind of in the middle of our series on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is teaching his followers the way of righteousness. And in helping us understand how we can pursue right living, one of the questions that we might have in that consideration is, you know, what are my rights as a Christian? Like, what, what are the things that I have a right to? And we see that that's a popular question in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the writers are dealing with Christ followers asking, can I do this or can I do this? So we get questions in the New Testament like, can I eat food sacrificed to idols? Is that a right that I have as a Christian? And the answer is a strong maybe. <laughs> and, and then we, we get other questions like, can I sue my brother in Christ? Or can I withhold my taxes? Or can I disobey an evil master? All of these are really questions of rights. Like, what right do I have in pursuing righteous living? Well, as he has done throughout his sermon so far in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to continually continue to brutally and methodically tear back our layers of pride and worldliness by teaching us about retaliation. When we think about retaliation and retribution, it's something that a lot of us think we have a right to. For, for, for myself, even in moments, I find myself grasping at a right to retribution and retaliation. And here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, Jesus attacks my grasp of that. 
And he attacks your grasp of that. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. God's word says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This passage is one of six where Jesus goes back to an Old Testament passage and says, you have heard this, but I say to you this. Last week, we, we looked at oath-taking, truth-telling. Next week, we're going to be looking at how we love our enemies and how we treat enemies. And here, we're looking at how do we deal with being offended? How do we deal with being hurt? And he says, you have heard that it was said, verse, verse 38 says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy all have this basic concept written into law. Look at Leviticus 24, 19 through 20. This is what it says. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Now, on the surface, this is both brutal and sensible. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine getting into a fight, causing a broken bone or a fracture, and then my punishment being the same fracture. It feels and sounds brutal, but it also sounds sensible. Okay, it's justice is getting what you deserve. Maybe I deserve what I gave. And, and so while on the sim, uh, surface, both sensible and brutal, we can consider this just simple justice. I mean, this is as simple as justice can be. And I, I think if you have a sibling, you know this concept of eye for eye, <laughs> tooth for tooth. Uh, I, I, I think about the times when I, my and my brothers, like we so feared greater wrath of parents finding out we had been mean to each other that like if I punched one of my brothers, they would, I would say, look, look, just punch me back. Just punch me back. Uh, I, don't tell mom, just punch me back. You can hit me the same place I hit you. Like we get that that seems fair. Like it seems more fair that I would receive what I gave you than have to face the judgment of a parent. We, we understand this. And, and in understanding this, we also see the idea that this isn't just about us getting what we deserve if we cause an offense. This isn't just about, okay, someone broke a bone, so we break his bone. Good, vengeance, it, that's settled. It is also about protecting the aggressor from overly harsh punishments. I, I, I mean, it's, it's possible to think about someone, you may even know someone who has been hurt in a way. And instead of uh, responding to that in a measured and reasonable way, I mean, it's like throwing nukes all over it. Uh, how, do you, how do you come back to someone who has hurt you and destroy their world? Uh, that, that's what's being protected here. If you knock someone's tooth out, the worst that they can do to you is knock your tooth out as well. So really, it protects the person in the wrong as well from too harsh of a judgment. But it's, So it's not so much of an, an excuse for vengeance as much as this command in the Old Testament was to protect against feuds. I mean, there's no way to have a feud if you settle the argument one for one, tooth for tooth, eye for eye. The Jewish audience listening to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount would have been well aware of this command. I mean, as they studied and were taught the law, this is a command that they wouldn't have missed. Being there multiple times in the law, they would have understood and known this command. Now, in, in Jesus's day, this wasn't necessarily applied exactly as it would have been when the law was given. They had developed some different ways to be able to pay back those debts. Even in the law, it allows for monetary financial repayment instead of having to pay with an eye. But it was still the idea of giving what was deserved. 
But in the next verse, from, from verse 38 to the next verse, we see Jesus plant seeds of grace in that soil of justice, where an eye for eye feels like simple justice. What we're going to see in verses 39 through 41 are seeds of grace being planted in that soil. Look back at verses 39 through 41 with me. God's word says, but I say to you, so you've heard all this, you've heard it said eye for eye, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. If we're looking at why is Jesus saying this? Why does he say, but I say to you? What is the clarification? What is he getting at? A really important measure here is that we should reject our rights. We should reject our rights. So that initial question, what are our rights as Christians? Well, very few. I mean, we have many privileges as Christians that to be called child of God. But what is our right as Christian here? Jesus is saying, reject your rights. You have this right to his eye if he takes your eye. But I'm telling you, reject your rights. And you can imagine the, the, the thought process back. Those who are listening to Jesus might be saying, but look, the law says tooth for tooth. Uh, look, this guy knocked my tooth out. It's my right to demand his tooth. <laughs> I, I like to think about uh, people getting in fights. In, uh, I don't think about this often, just as I'm preparing this. People getting in fights in like 300 B.C., like two, two people following God, following his law, they get into a fight. One knocks a tooth out and, and the guy's down. You know, he might have won the fight because he knocked a tooth out, but really he didn't win. Because I think about you know, how, how are you getting a tooth out in 300 BC? I mean, to follow this law to the letter, it, 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 it would hurt. And, and so what we're seeing in Jesus, what he's saying is, no, instead of pursuing extracting someone else's tooth for knocking yours out. Instead of that, here's something better. And what's better is rejecting your rights, laying your rights down. How about this instead? Don't resist the person who is trying to take advantage of your weakness. Don't resist the one who is evil. And, and right there, the one who is evil, we might think that that might be talking about uh, Satan. Sometimes he's referred to as the evil one. This is, this is just the one who is evil. It's just a person who is taking advantage of, the person who is the offender. Don't resist the person who is trying to take advantage of your weakness. Jesus is like, this is the better way. Maybe, maybe this person isn't just trying to take advantage of your weakness. Maybe this person is trying to make you weak. Maybe this person is trying to make your station in life worse. And Jesus is saying, don't resist that person. And that feels weird. Like, let's just be honest about it. That feels weird, especially when we consider it against our pride. I mean, what does that do for our pride if we don't resist someone who is taking advantage of our weakness against our culture? which our culture looks at us and calls us pansies and wimps if we don't stand up for ourselves and fight back if someone's trying to exploit our weaknesses. But, but I think what we see here in Scripture is that no one can really make us more weak than we are. <laughs> Look, you are weak. You are weak. No one can make you more weak because your weakness is truly a spiritual weakness. It's a spiritual brokenness. I think about sometimes we give ourselves these, these ornaments of status and comfort and physical beauty and strength, but it doesn't make us less weak. It's like taking a Christmas tree that has no green on it. It's a dead Christmas tree and putting some ornaments on it and being like, look how beautiful it is. No, no, you're just putting some ornaments on something that is broken, on something that isn't worthwhile, but like a tree that is brown that shouldn't have any use, Jesus comes into our life and makes something that couldn't be green, green again. He gives us new life. That's why we talk about it being born again, is that our strength, our our hope, our life's purpose is found in the life of Jesus, something new to us, something that shouldn't be a part of us. So when we find someone who is offending us, when we find the evil one who is, who is doing something that we might resist, like slapping one cheek or, or trying to sue or forcing us to go a mile, that person is not making us more broken or more a sinner. 
they're changing the ornaments on the tree. But for us, the real, the, the real root and base is knowing that our core is broken and only through the work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ can we be made new. So we look at things like status and beauty and strength and we know that those are things that people can take away from us. And it doesn't change our identity. It doesn't change our value. It doesn't change our purpose in Christ because our only true strength, our only true value, our only true status or comfort, our only true anything must be found in Jesus living through us. So Jesus says, what if you get slapped? What if you get slapped? There's physical pain there. I I mean, it's like a thing now. I don't know why it's a thing, but it's a thing now for like slapping competitions. I've seen some videos and it's like, I don't know, it's, it's weird, but people like stand and slap each other until they pass out. It's super weird. That's a thing, but there's physical pain to that. Like being slapped can knock you out. There's physical pain, but maybe even greater than that, even maybe even more than being slapped, being physical pain is the humiliation of it. Like, can you imagine being in a square here or being around friends? Some of you, you may have experienced this, but to be slapped is, is a humiliating thing. And Jesus is like, what if this happens to you? What if, what if there's physical pain? What if there's humiliation? What do you do? What's the response of a Christian? What is your right as a Christian? You've heard tooth for tooth, eye for eye, fracture for fracture, but now, but now in the new covenant, now with, with a savior who has not just uh, come to not only, he's not abolishing the law, he's not abolishing, but now a savior who has fulfilled the law. Now, how do we respond? What do we do? Well, you do have the option still to claim your right to retribution. You have that option. But in that option, we don't live in the way of righteousness. This is not the heart of that law. The heart of that law is not to find retribution. Instead, Jesus pushes us to the other option, the option to reject that right of retribution and instead show mercy. That's that's the option that God is calling us to here. He's saying, don't give what is deserved. Do not claim that right. Jesus says the better way is to turn the other cheek. The better way is to turn the other cheek. It's the better way is about embracing weakness. Embracing weakness. I can't think of an area in our lives where people come to us and say, just embrace your weakness. It's fine. Just embrace your weakness. In, in every area of my life, from growing up, from school to sports to work to wherever, it's been, let's shore up those weaknesses. <laughs> hey, this is where you're weak. Let's get better. I, I used to be a teacher and I, we used to have these teacher reviews and it would be like, hey, here's your low marks and here's where you need to get better. My scores were always perfect. And I'm, I, that was that was a joke. I'm not lying there. It was just a joke. My scores were never perfect. <laughs> but there, uh, it was, hey, here's where you need to improve. This is your weakness. I never had a principal come to me and say, just embrace your weaknesses. It's fine. You're weak. It's fine. It was always improve them. But here, Jesus, what he's giving to us in telling us to reject our rights is really to embrace our weakness. He's calling us not to make ourselves strong and equal, that if we get slapped in the face, what would make us strong and equal would be to slap that person back in the face, to get even. And that's that's the temptation of the flesh is to get even, to show that we aren't the wimp, that we aren't the weakling, that we are strong, that we are able to defend ourselves, that we are enough. No one can come do that to me. Don't come disrespect me. That's That's the natural temptation of the flesh. And Jesus is teaching us a way of righteousness, the way of him that is completely different than the way of the flesh. And what he's teaching us here is to humble ourselves and to be weak. To humble ourselves and to be weak, to embrace our weakness. Church, we have a call on our lives to make ourselves low. It's not our goal to be the most important person in the room. 
It's our goal to be the lowest person in the room, to be the servant, to be the one who is most like Christ in the way that we walk in our families and in our jobs and in our schools, in our dormitories, wherever God has us, that we might be seen as the servant, as the lowliest, not as the most important, as the one with the most authority, as the one who gets to tell other people what to do. That's not what we see here. What we see here is someone who is willing to not only get slapped, (laughs) but willingly turn the other cheek instead of fight back. Getting, against, getting justice against that person really doesn't make us more whole. Again, think back to our brokenness thing here. That if someone comes to us and offends us by slapping us, hurts us, humiliates us, in reality, what does getting back at that person earn us? It doesn't earn us anything in the eyes of Christ here. And as Christians, what we claim is that our only value and importance is how Jesus views us. So if we claim that, if that's what we say to be true, then what does retribution mean for us? The only thing we desire is for God to get glory somehow out of someone slapping us. That's the heart of this. Saving face from humiliation has no ability to make you strong. Only Jesus can make you more whole. And the work that Jesus did to make you whole is done. It's done. We get to rest. We get to come to him with a light burden because the work is done of salvation. Instead of being strong, instead of working and exhausting ourselves to be the most strong, to to prove ourselves in this world, we get to be, as Christ followers, weak. We get to be humble. We We get to be kind to the person who doesn't deserve it. We get to be kind to the person who just punched us in the face. Jesus says, what if someone sues you? I mean, what if someone sues you and takes your tunic? Do you fight in anger? Do you file a countersuit? Do you get retribution? Well, here, I, we don't, I, in our culture, in our time, we don't wear tunics and cloaks. I, I, I think a, a reasonable way to think about that would be like an undershirt to your, to your shirt, or even like right now, maybe this shirt being a tunic and my jacket being a cloak. But what if someone takes my shirt? Like, what if someone comes to me and says, Mark, I, I need your shirt. Give me your shirt. I mean, what, is, what does that do? You think about the consequences of that. What it does is it leaves us humiliated and exposed. Generally, people don't walk around without clothes on. And so if I'm walking around without a shirt on, it's humiliating, it's it's exposing. And Jesus is saying, hey, in the face of that, what about your value to Christ changes? What about your strength in Jesus do you get back by fighting that? in the face of humiliation and being exposed, let him have your cloak as well. Don't just give him your tunic, give him your cloak as well as a servant, as a kind and humble servant. Let him have your cloak, let him have your jacket as well. The ability to be able to give someone your cloak and jacket is a heart condition. It comes out of a heart condition that says, I understand my purpose. I understand my worth. I understand my value, that it doesn't come from me be, being able to get even with the person who hurt me, but it comes from me glorifying God with every ounce of my existence. Some of us are filled with longing. I've, all of us are filled with longing, but some of us are filled with a longing for the things of this world. We long for fame. We just want to be discovered on TikTok. We just want to be discovered on Instagram. We long for wealth. Man, if I just had more money, man, I'd love to have this car or that house or these clothes. Some of us long for status and respect, to be known, to to be admired. But the heart condition of a Christ follower longs for something different. What do you long for? In this moment, what are you longing for? I can tell you, there's part of my heart right now that longs to just be out in public and see my friends again and give some hugs. I'm not a hugger, but man, I would love to just give some big bear hugs to people right now. Some of me longs for that, and I hope in a, in a Christ-satisfying way, but more than the way I long for that, more than the way I long for food after the day of fasting, I want to long for Jesus with my life. 
I want to long for his glory and for him to be exalted. I want to long for his return so that I can be with him. And if I'm longing for him in that way, then it's not a hard thing for me to give up a cloak or a tunic or to turn the other cheek or to walk an extra mile when I'm longing for him because I've laid down the rights to the things of this world. I don't care about the things of this world. I don't care about the rights to this world because I'm longing for Christ. I can embrace my weakness because it's never about me anyway. My longings aren't for my greatness. My longings are for Jesus' greatness. That's what we're longing for here. To reject our rights and to embrace our weakness takes a heart and mind that have been transformed by the radical love of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you're listening right now, has your heart been transformed by Jesus Christ? Has your heart been transformed or are you just understanding that, hey, Christianity does some good things for my life? If Christianity does good things for your life, your longings won't change. But if your heart has been transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit to want Jesus more than anything, then your heart changes. Then your longings change. Then your ability to be humiliated and exposed doesn't do anything to your value or your identity. Instead, all of that is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus continues and asks, you know, what if, what if anyone forces you to go one mile? And, and if you're reading this without context or without history, maybe what does that mean? Like, what are we saying? Like, someone wants us to go running with them? Uh, D.A. Carson here talks about, talks about this. D.A. Carson explains the history of this line to mean that Roman soldiers could basically commandeer civilians to carry their luggage. It's a pretty interesting thing. Like, when I think about commandeering, I think about commandeering objects, I imagine a police officer commandeering the nice convertible, like the one that goes fast so they can get in street chases in the movie. You know what I'm talking about, right? But we commandeer objects. And so when we, when we think about a historical narrative where Roman soldiers could commandeer human beings to do work for them, it objectifies them. Again, like it would be with getting slapped in the face, like it would be for losing your tunic and your jacket, this would be humiliating that you don't have rights as a person here to carry my things. Do what I tell you. It's, it's almost enslavement. It's, it's abusive. It's, opp- it's oppressive. I think about, man, the, the fury that would be unleashed in our context if this happened. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were walking down the road and and, and a, a soldier from a country not ours forced you to carry their luggage. I, I just can't imagine. And, and for good reason. But not just humiliation, the frustration of this. We would be right to feel those things. But Jesus says, change your mind. Change your mind. The right you have to be frustrated and humiliated, drop those things. And in your mind, let your heart be focused on the glory of God. So if someone comes to you and tells you, carry my things for a mile, instead of just giving them that, be a kind servant, be a better servant than they could have asked for and take it two miles. And don't do it with an attitude of superiority or look what I'm doing or how great am I because it's not about you, it's about your weakness. Do it with an attitude of, I'd love to serve you. If I can take it one mile, could I take it another? Here we see this in the example of the Jews in that time, hearing Jesus speaking, he was speaking to their situation. And what is your situation? I mean, where is your attitude of service like this? I think about your homes. I mean, maybe your attitude of service is to your parent, to your parents. I can imagine many of you who are living with your parents right now, struggling to serve your parents with this heart condition, with this attitude of humility and surrender, and weakness. Many of you dealing with your parents are thinking, I need to prove to my parents that I have a right to do the things that I'm doing, whether that's laying on your couch, or working in your room, or working hard at your schoolwork, whatever it is, I need to prove to my parents. You have nothing to prove to your parents except obedience. (laughs) I think about parents, man, to, to, to your kids. Is there a way that you can be weak and serve your kids? Spouses, how can you be weak and serve each other? 
in your workplaces, those of you who are still going into work, those of you who are working from home and having to interact over virtual phone, uh, virtual meetings and phone calls, how do you serve in those settings? It's a call here to serve those who don't deserve to be served. How much more in your life to those who deserve to be served should we approach them with this attitude of weakness and humility and kindness? Here where they had every right for humiliation and frustration, Jesus says, change your mind. Instead of, instead of resisting this oppression, instead of exposing your oppression, instead of Jesus taking this and saying, look, you are oppressed, person who has to carry this a mile. He could have said, that's, that's oppression. I'm calling out this physical oppression. You had to walk a mile and you shouldn't have. Shame on the Roman soldiers. What Jesus instead says is shame on you for not being willing to serve them. Instead of calling out our oppression, he's exposing their oppression. It truly exposes their oppression. Physical oppression is terrible. We shouldn't shouldn't, uh, negate that. Physical oppression in any way is terrible. But the spiritual oppression of sin is much worse. The consequences of spiritual oppression of sin outweighs any type of physical oppression. And eternity apart from God is the worst consequence that could happen from oppression. And Jesus is saying, look, you who might be physically oppressed for a while, consider the spiritual oppression that might be eternal for the one who is giving you that oppression. Consider spiritual oppression. The one who slaps, sues, and takes advantage is suffering a deep spiritual depravity. So what is your response? Is your response to treat this person like a temporary life that has no meaning, a clump of cells that will end up in the dirt? Or are you treating this person as an eternal being who will either be with Christ forever or apart from him forever? That's your choice in every setting. That's your choice in every scenario. How do you treat someone? Do you treat them as someone who is dealing with spiritual oppression or someone instead who has no consequence If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Go with him two miles, serve him well so that he might ask you, what makes you serve me? What makes you be humble? Why wouldn't you fight this? Because we have a savior who did so much more. My savior carried my cross on his shoulders. My savior went further for me than I could ever go for you. He gave me much more than this tunic or cloak and he took much more than a slap on the face for me. So I will serve you like he served me. Let's change our minds. Let's go two miles. Our response as saved and redeemed people is to meet the oppressed with grace and mercy. Our response is to reject our rights and to embrace our weakness so that the strength of Christ might be made perfect in our weakness. It truly is the example of Jesus The prophet Isaiah said that the Messiah would give his back to those who strike and his cheeks to those who pull out the beard. He would not hide his face from disgrace and spitting. And that prophecy from Isaiah, we see it fulfilled in Matthew 26. In Matthew 26, guess what we see? We see Jesus in front of the high priest and council and they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is that that struck you? But Jesus, but Jesus did not, account, did not count his equality with God as something to be grasped. But instead, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself He humbled himself in spite of those spitting in his face and slapping him and mocking him. He humbled himself in obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. He didn't just humble himself in front of those who were abusing him in the moments before his crucifixion. He humbled himself in front of us. He humbled himself so that we could be saved Jesus had the right to demand justice for our actions against him. We're living in the mercy of Jesus' decision to humble himself on the cross. He could have demanded account 
for our rebellion because our every sin is an act of rebellion. But Jesus rejected his rights and embraced his weakness for our sake and his glory. Jesus did not stay humiliated, though. Here's the hope in this. You're like, Mark, where's the hope? What's the point of this? If we're just going to have to be frustrated and humiliated and exposed, like, what is all this for? When we look to the example of Jesus who laid his life down for us, we see in his example, he didn't stay humiliated because he recognized the temporal nature of this life. Instead, because he was obedient in weakness, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, so that at his name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself by being born in the likeness of men we too must humble ourselves by being born again in the likeness of Jesus. You can be born again. You can be born again. You can trade in the oppression of sin and the need for retribution and getting even. You can trade in the emptiness of competition and strength and the standards of beauty and wealth in this world, and you can embrace the glory and freedom and hope of being a child of God. And that is a good trade. That is a good trade that is offered to you because of what Christ did by shedding his blood on the cross and rising again. Romans says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You can be saved. Are you ready to do that right now? Are you ready to make Jesus Lord of your life and embrace your weakness and experience his strength in your life? When we are weak, we reflect this gospel. We reflect the beauty of a savior who had every opportunity to get even, but instead laid down his rights and chose to offer himself up for our salvation. This call to weakness, this call to salvation is for you. Man, all it takes is telling Jesus that. It doesn't take praying with a pastor. It doesn't take special words. It takes giving your life to Jesus, to calling out to him, telling him you believe who he is and that he's done what he said he's done. To repent from your sins and turn to him. When we turn to him, no longer is our goal to take an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Now our goal is to look like Jesus. Now our goal is, it is to look weak because he looked weak. And as we share in his weakness, we also someday will share in his glory. Indeed, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. That's what, that's what scripture calls us to is not just his suffering, but also his glory. It should be noticed that Jesus' weakness was not passive though. Jesus' weakness was not passive. Until glory for him and until glory for us, that weakness is not passive. Instead, his weakness was kind. His weakness was generous. When, when, he gave, when he rejected his rights, he didn't just take the beating. He gave more. He gave his cloak. He turned the other cheek. He walked the extra mile. His weakness was generous and kind. Instead of serving himself, he actively served others. It's exactly what he teaches us in verse 42. The last verse we're looking at this morning. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This is radical Jesus-like weakness. I mean, this is, this is radical. Instead of always looking to come out on top or even to come out even, we look to give others the advantage. That's the message here. Give others the advantage. Make others more important than yourselves. We look to make others greater. This is weakness marked by generosity. When we're willing to not be the hero of our stories, and as we make Jesus the hero of the story, we lift others up. Jesus threw in this last match to burn down the straw man of our strength that we build in our own mind. When we think about what makes us strong, what gives us the ability to be strong and, and to, to take care of ourselves, so many times, don't we, don't we 
settle all of that on our finances? Isn't it so often that as our bank account goes, so our strength goes? That hits here for me. That hits here. And here, Jesus knows that. That's a human thing, is to consider our wealth in connection to our strength. And Jesus wants to make sure that we understand that all of our wealth is truly his. That we are stewarding what he's given us. And that's what he calls us to here in verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you. Like, don't hold back. Our money can be the end all be all of how we measure our success and how we measure our value and our safety and our happiness. And here Jesus is saying, don't measure yourself by this. Measure yourself by your generosity. Measure yourself by your kindness to those who don't deserve it. Measure yourself against the example of Christ, not against the amount in your bank account. Your bank account doesn't make you more or less broken. I mean, do you have a cool million hanging out in your bank account? Cool, man. <laughs> Praise God for that. You still need Jesus, and you, need to, you still need to follow him with every dollar. Did the stimulus check that you just got save you from overdrafting your bank account? <laughs> Well, praise God. Cool. You still need Jesus and you need to follow him with every dollar. You need to be generous and kind, even with your finances, to those who don't deserve it. Don't let money keep you from being weak the way that God has called you to be weak. We need to show weakness and show reliance on Christ with our bodies, with our emotions, with our bank accounts. Let's pursue God in our weakness. When we do this, his gospel shines through and the world will be changed around us because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I want to leave you with a few challenges. First is approach every situation with weakness and generosity. Approach every situation with weakness and generosity. Every situation with the example of Christ and the promise of eternity in mind. Usually, the passage is going to apply best to your relationship with a sibling, parent, child, or spouse that's metaphorically suing for your tunic. I, I think about my kids at home just about every day are metaphorically suing for mine and my wife's tunic every day. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we're begging for bedtime, not because we don't love our kids, but because we understand the struggle of family. Maybe it's a professor or a coworker or even a social media foe. <laughs> Whatever it is, we need to change our minds about how we pursue these relationships and pursue them in light of Christ. Approach them with weakness and generosity. Remember that your goal is for them to know Christ. Your goal in every relationship, your goal in every exchange is for that person to know and love and enjoy Christ. And the last challenge, ask the Holy Spirit to help you be wise and to have discernment in knowing the limits to the principles of weakness and generosity. I mean, there is a time to escape abuse instead of just being weak through it. The Bible gives us that in other passages that, that we should help others be, get out of this physical oppression. That it shouldn't just be this way. There is a time to not give money to every person that asks. I mean, there is, there is a foolishness in giving all of your money away to every person instead of caring for yourself and having things for your family that you're able to eat and work as well. I mean, there are ends to these things. And, and the Bible here in this passage doesn't approach the ends with us. Christ doesn't say, do this, turn the other cheek, and then be done. It, it, give him your cloak and then be, there's no, he doesn't give us the limits here, but we know that through the work of his Holy Spirit, giving us wisdom and, and the way that we approach his word and through the work of the church that God can help us find those limits. And let's, let's pray that the Holy Spirit would help us understand those limits well, correctly. Church, let me pray for you now. <laughs> We've heard a lot. We've understood scripture this morning. and I'm so grateful that you've hung tough through it, that you've stayed with me and, and considered what God ha God's word has to say. But I wanna take this time right now to pray for you as, as what you hear becomes a part of your life, that we not just be hearers of the word, but that we become doers of the word together. So let me pray for you 
And I'm going to pray for you now also to live sin and to change the world with the gospel as you reject your rights and embrace your weakness. Pray with me. Father, I think of the, the faces of those who are a part of Provision Church, and, and I even understand, God, that there's people watching right now who, who don't belong to Provision Church, who, who are watching this and, and maybe are just stumbled onto it, listening to this, just stumbling onto it. And, and God, as I consider them, I consider the way that pride creeps in and the way that the, the goals of this world creep in. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal the world creep in our, in our lives. The places where instead of choosing the most beautiful thing by choosing you, we're instead choosing the temporary destructive things of this world. God, help us to turn to you more than anything. God, I pray that if there's someone listening right now, someone that is, is, is watching right now that doesn't know you, God, pr- save them. Stir in their hearts. Let them be uneasy until they give their lives to you. God, that they would repent and follow after you. God, you are deserving of our lives, both now and for eternity. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty grave. We thank you for this life that you're giving us to live until you return. We love you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the message. We hope that it was very enlightening and uplifting. If you do have any questions or you're unsure about anything that was said today, we ask you to contact any of our elders or members here at Provision uh, through your personal contacts that you may have or through our social media accounts. Um, We know times are hard right now, and if there's anything that the church can help you with, Uh, even outside the the message and questions you may have, please contact us there as well. As for the church, we just want to challenge you to live sent and change the world.